Welcome to Be Provided Conservation Radio, sharing stories and information about the environment, wildlife, and the people who are dedicating their lives to protect the world for future generations. These inspirational stories will take you from the Santa Cruz Mountains to remote areas of Africa. Here are your hosts. Hello everyone, welcome to Be Provided Conservation Radio. I'm Marcia Civic and your host today. I have a treat for you today, a conversation about snow leopards with Dr. Rodney Jackson, founder of the Snow Leopard Conservancy. For the past three decades, Dr. Rodney Jackson has been the leading expert on these elusive and beautiful cats. So this ended up being a longer than usual podcast episode when it was all said and done, and I didn't want to leave any valuable information out, so I broke the episode up into two parts. Today you'll hear part one, where Rodney talks about his history and finding his path to snow leopard conservation, and some on the snow leopard behavior. And part two next week, Rodney starts off describing the challenges these beautiful cats are facing and how the Snow Leopard Conservancy is addressing these challenges successfully. And he also shares with us what gives him hope for the future of these cats and other wildlife. So if you want to learn more about the Snow Leopard Conservancy, please visit www.snowleopardconservancy.com. Dot .org to learn more. So please enjoy this week's conversation and make sure to download and listen to part 2 next week. Welcome to the show Rodney, it's such an honor to have you here. Well, thank you Marsha. It's really a great to be here as well and to share our experiences with your listeners. Um I'm always very excited to talk about snow leopards. Oh, I can imagine. And um, just between you and me um, (laughs) and our listeners, I guess, uh, snow leopards are probably one of my favorite cats, actually. They're so beautiful. So I just thought I would share that. And I'm sure you agree. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So I... um, just briefly, I, I did throw out on social media to have anyone ask any questions for you, and mm-hmm. it's a new concept. Um, so I didn't get many questions, but I did get one, and it's kind of lighthearted, and I was hoping it would be okay to ask you that and just have a uh, kind of ease into our conversation. Sure, why not? <laughs> so the question was from, I wasn't sure if this was a hoax or not until I did a little research and I found out that this is true. So um, our listener is a, a young Facebook friend and he wanted to be anonymous, but he wanted me to ask you if it was true if the snow leopard face was actually the design used for the movie Avatar for the Navi people in Pandora. <laughs> oh my goodness. He's well informed. Yeah. He really is. Yes, it is true, actually. And we know that because of the Disney designers, we were in touch with them well after the film was released. But in relation to um, making a, a paintings and uh, an expedition to Mongolia, and that's when we learned about it. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, I actually first heard you speak at one of the earlier WCN talks, and I believe you mentioned that. And I was kind of, you know, I didn't ask him where he had heard that. But, yeah, I thought that would be a fun intro. <laughs> so this, yeah. so there, famous... there are many there are other things, and we can talk about <laughs> Yetis later and a few other things. But, yeah, you know, life is strange because, I, frankly, I would never in my wildest dreams when I was growing up would I ever, ever imagine that I'd end up in the Himalayas and devoting my entire life to uh, working to protect the snow leopards. Yeah, yeah. How, how Can you tell us how that all started with you? What, what piqued your interest in this? I guess it was a merging of a lot of sort of circumstances from different directions. But Mm -hmm. basically, I was born in South Africa and grew up in Zimbabwe. And I was growing up in the time of the winds of change, you know, when a lot of these countries were getting their independence. But as a young kid, I was always totally fascinated by books on wildlife. And in those days, really, the most literature was really on tracking animals in the bush because of hunters 
and people like Salu who worked across Central Asia, and they were often explorers, actually going into areas where there were, uh, you know, nobody had visited or documented, uh, and around the time of Livingston, I suppose, exploring Africa, there they were out looking for ivory. Elephants mm -hmm. have a long history of being hunted, I guess. But what I was fascinated by is is just the the tracking skills that you know they were developing, and I lived on the edge of town of uh, Salisbury, it's now Harare, and there was this big uh, grassy valley uh, across the road, and I would go there each morning after, even before school, but certainly after school, and go tracking animals myself and learning to read the sign of the different antelopes, of the predators, there were leopards there, there wow. were some other small cats, and it, I was just, um, that's all I wanted to do was go out and uh, study animals. And of course, what better place than Africa where you had all the <laughs> national parks. Right. But it turned out uh, I had a summer job in Kafue National Park in Zambia, and they really wanted to hire me. However, because I was living in the country then known as Rhodesia, which was a rebel country, uh, it was difficult for them and their civil service to approve a hire, especially of a white person from there. So I realized really if I wanted to stay in Africa, I needed to get an education in, and stay ahead of everything mm -hmm. and be, uh, you know, have strong credentials for being employed. And I'd always admired Aldo Leopold. I'd read his books early on, and he had a, he was actually the first person to write a textbook on wildlife management. It was called Game Management. Mm -hmm. And I was totally convinced that I really needed to study under his son, who was a professor of wildlife con uh, management at the University of California, Berkeley. Oh. And so I wrote him and I said, I really want to come and get a master's degree. Uh, can you help me? And he said, well, you know, we don't have funding to bring people from overseas. But if you happen to find your way over to this continent, then contact me and let's see what we can do. <laughs> and of course, I found my way over to the continent by England. And uh, to cut a sh long story short, I got a scholarship. And I ended up studying deer and coyotes in South Texas, and he was my co-major professor. Wow. So we worked through, and I got my master's degree. And about the end, towards the end of my master's degree, a National Geographic uh, cover came out and a story on the first images of snow leopards in the wild by the infamous biologist uh, George Shala. Mm -hmm. And it was this cat sitting on a rocky ledge in Pakistan with snow mountains around around her. And I said, you know, I, want, I just want to see the Himalayas before I go back to uh, Africa, wherever I was going to get a job, <laughs> in Central or East Africa. Mm -hmm. And I went to Nepal, and I had the unique uh, opportunity actually to go into a very remote area, Western Nepal. Very few foreigners have been there, maybe two or three. And it was really like stepping back 100 or 200 years because the whole district did not have one wheel in it. There were no roads. <laughs> you walked everywhere. Yeah. I walked 12 days just to get into the snow leopard area. Wow. And when I was there, it, the people were sort of living, you know, they had no electricity. Uh, there was one little radio in the village, so they had some knowledge of the outside world, but otherwise they were totally isolated. And there in the valley above, what did I find? But lots of tracks of snow leopards. Wow. Well, and I followed them. They were incredibly elusive. You know, they'd come right past my tent at night. <laughs> <laughs> but they were so quiet, I never heard them. I never saw them. I saw their sign. Yeah. And I They're... realized they were under threat. They were being hunted by local people uh, because they perceived them as a pest, actually. Mm. And 
you know, that, that said something to me. It said, well, I could go back to Africa. There's a lot of people working on conservation in Africa, but nobody's working on the snow leopard. This is 1978, and we know nothing about this cat. Wow. So, so you didn't really know anything about snow leopards before seeing this National Geographic photo. And I think I know which photo you're talking about. It's beautiful. Um, so that that that's when you're like, I need to go there and and go to Nepal and and Himalayas and look these guys up. Right. Yeah. And about the same time, I in some other magazine, I've forgotten where I saw it, there was an advertisement um, uh, from Rolex Watch Company, mm -hmm. and it was advertising uh, and calling for applications for the Rolex Awards for Enterprise, and I think it was the second round of it, as I remember. About the same time, I met Darla, my uh, wife, and uh, I said, you know, I've been to this area. I know a little bit about where snow leopards live. And what I really need to be doing is using my skills to uh, live trap them and attach radio collars and track them and find out exactly what habitats and, and what daily movements and what they ate, all wow. this vital information to uh, protecting a species. And that that I was know. a that was a fairly sorry to interrupt you. That was a fairly new concept at that time, right? For the radio tracking uh, and the collars, uh, or well, they probably radio collars had probably been in the use for maybe ten years at that mm, point, but okay. but never really put on such an elusive shy animal. Yeah. And George Shala, who you know in many ways is is a mentor to many people, certainly he was to me too, um, had tried to study them in Pakistan, but he had failed. And he, you know, put it down to the animal being just so shy and elusive that they probably would never be studied. I, I thought, well, you know, well, I saw them coming past my tent almost, you know, once a week anyway, maybe yeah. twice a week. I said, well, I think it is it's possible. It's just, George, you were in the wrong place. You were in a place where everybody had guns and they were hunting and where I am in Western Nepal, they don't have guns. They do have other methods of hunting, but they're not as, you know, they haven't totally depleted the snow leopard population. Right, right. So because I had been in this area and spent three months and had documented, uh, oh, a lot of the activities of the local people with aboriginal hunting of uh, musk deer, which is one of the prey species of snow leopards. Mm. I knew a lot about the environment. I knew the challenges that I would face. I knew some of the solutions that I could bring to deal with that. So I said, well, let's put together a proposal for Rolex. And, I, you know, I thought I'd, I'd have some interest in it. They would be interested in it. Well, lo and behold... <laughs> About, oh, uh, it must have been three, four months after the application went in, I got a call from Switzerland asking if somebody could come out from Geneva and interview me in San Francisco. I said, sure. <laughs> so they came out for the afternoon, and they left. They arrived at about noon, and they left at 3 o'clock again to go back to Geneva. Wow. But they interviewed me, asked me a lot of questions, and, you know, I thought, wow, boy, they're coming all this way. I can talk about something, but I haven't, I've never done this. How am I going to convince them that it's possible and it's not a, a dream in the sky where, you know, the leading biologists in the world had failed at it? I, I, I think it's really possible. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I showed yeah. them a lot of, of slides of the area, of the tracks, and it, it clearly convinced them. And a few months later, I, I was one of the finalists. Wow, congratulations. And yeah. I, it was wonderful, yeah. yeah. And that, of course, made uh, it possible to go back to Nepal, equipped with some funding and the radio collars, and uh, live trap a snow leopard, immobilize it, and fit these uh, very high-frequency collars that all have to be tracked from the ground. So everything's muddy boots in the ground, as mm -hmm. it were. Yeah. And not sitting in an office as happens nowadays, and you've got a satellite uh, connected 
collar on an animal halfway across the world and you don't have to even be anywhere near it <laughs> yeah. to know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, like you it said, it, it took you 12 days to even get to where these were to get to your research site. And so you had to haul in probably radio antennas and such to track them as well, too, huh? We so, did. Yeah, All the huh? equipment uh, that wow. was needed it had to come with us yeah. uh, most of the food that we needed had to come with us the only thing we could uh, procure locally were potatoes and even those were in quite short supply so yeah it was I organized an expedition and when Dala went and I went in the first time in in the fall of 1981 um, we must have had 70 porters carrying loads, so it was sort uh-huh. of like a mountaineering expedition. And we stayed in this area for 11 months. We didn't come out, wow. uh, but we were, you know, trapping the cats. And, and during that time, we managed to trap, at that time, just uh, one cat, I guess, in the first season. Oh, um, just just one cat in that 11 months? Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. it, you know, they... They are all elusive, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah. But what I really remember of that 11-month period when we didn't come out is just how wonderful it was to be in a place where you never saw a jet trail, you never heard a motorized vehicle. All there was was the uh, Longu River roaring down the valley and the sounds of wildlife and the... Uh, Local villages coming through occasionally looking for medicinal plants and things like that. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I would like that, especially these days when we're so tuned into technology. Um, speaking of, since we're doing this over Skype today. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. So, so you and Darla stayed there for both for the 11 months? And, the first year, then yeah. we would come back and we'd, we'd spend, we realized it was difficult to work th- during the monsoon, the reason mm. being that the river uh, rose very high and that the bridges we had were usually washed away, so we never really had good access within the study area. And we also realized that uh, the cats would move up in elevation, that the load cloud cover would make it difficult for us to track the cats, although uh, obviously radio signals penetrate rocks. When you're dealing with radio tracking, the signal is sort of like a rubber ball. You throw it against a wall, it's going to bounce off in another direction. And so when you get a directional signal, you really need to know where it's coming from and you need to judge whether it's a a bounced, reflected signal or not. And that was difficult during the monsoon with low cloud cover. So we would basically work from the start of winter to the beginning of monsoon from, let's say, October sometime through uh, very early June. And that was probably long enough to live on rice and potatoes every day, (laughs) three times a day. Yeah, I was going to say, you guys uh, probably were very fit, but probably... pretty hungry for some different meals afterwards so oh absolutely yeah it was, uh, when we got back home it was uh, we, we, we just didn't know what to eat because there were so <laughs> many choices you know i know i know just even just going backpacking i mean peanut butter and jelly is like the best thing ever so yes. <laughs> you know the, the well, simple we had things one jaw of yeah. peanut butter for six months so oh my gosh <laughs> so <laughs> So while you were out there, you you did only trap one. You said which, which is sounds like it's successful with um, how elusive they are. But were you seeing tracks of them coming around your campsites? You know, at all during the evening? Uh, oh, we were yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, it was so the first time they've been ever collared, and so yeah. you know, you there's a learning curve there. Yeah. And at the same time, we realized we learned a lot, and we learned where we should put the traps. We also decided that late winter is a better time to, you know, more likely to trap them. Uh, using we were using leg snares that had a special catch on them that prevented the noose from tightening mm-hmm. too much. But the problem would happen is if it, if it snowed, uh, the snow would cover the trap. Uh-huh. Uh, 
the temperatures would drop well down to, oh, probably 10 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, minus 15 or 25 degrees at night, and that snow would freeze up. And so you could almost have a, a person stand on the trap release, and it, you know, it just wouldn't go off. Yeah. yeah. And so the cats often walked over these without tripping them. That was the issue. Wow. And we realize we need to continue. We realize that one cat is, is not going to tell us how all snow leopards are going to, what you know their habits or patterns were, because mm-hmm. they're certainly individuals. And also, we made contact with National Geographic magazine at that time, who said, well, we'd be love to support you through our grants program, but you're going to have to go out and prove you can do it again and again. Yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, that was a came down to a three and a half, four year program, and we did do it. We ended up collaring five snow leopards in all, some of them getting retrapped again and again, and, and new radios fitted on them. Um, but, you know, we got, I guess, the definitive information that really remained our, our best scientific knowledge for almost uh, 20 years. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. So, so these, so you were able to to track these. What what other information were you able to get out of them? What you know, as you were tracking them, you know, their their location, travel sites, and such. We we yes, there's yeah. a number of, of information you get. Obviously, yeah. you're trying to get a sight in of them, so that you can stay on them and see how they hunt. But they proved to be quite elusive in part because the area was pretty heavily vegetated and they used the cover, whether it was, uh, you know, trees and shrubs or uh, even rocks, actually, Mm. very well. They really stayed hidden. And I became totally convinced that snow leopards saw more people than people saw snow leopards. And it was down to the cat that cat just didn't want to be spotted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So we could find out how far do they move, how mm-hmm. do they interact with one another, uh, what kind of prey they food base they use by two techniques. One is obviously finding a kill site and going and sexing the age of the hoofed animal that they've killed. Another is to collect their scats, their poop, mm-hmm. and uh, pull it apart and look at the, uh, the hair that's there and identify the hair according to the species and bones, you know, uh, different feathers and all that sort of stuff give you a pretty good handle on the composition of a snow leopard's diet. Uh, the, the challenge with radio tracking from the ground, the area was extremely rugged yeah. and very steep slope, loose talus, difficult to move around because of a lot of cliffs that were, you know, not easily negotiated and or dangerous, really. So it would take us all day to get a fix on an animal. And we had, at, at one time, we had four of them concurrently. And, you know, we learned very quickly that they were expert at avoiding one another unless it was in the mating season, obviously, with males looking for females and vice versa. Oh, interesting. So they they remain individual or separate until mating time, huh? Or solo. So up until that date, most of the information on big cats came from a study of tigers in the lowland, from George Schaller's work on lions, which is a social animal where snow leopards, leopards, tigers, jaguars, all pretty well solitary animals. They don't have that pride structure at all. Mm. Um, And what we found out is that all of our cats, uh, there were three males and two females, overlapped Uh, I would say, by 80% or more of their home ranges. Hmm. The challenge was it was difficult for us to cover the full home range, and the cats would disappear for a day or two, and they'd go over the ridge line that we couldn't get over, or we we couldn't look on the other side because there was just no access for us. Right. 
So it was hard to get a handle, but what we did find out is that while their home range overlapped almost completely, there was a core central area where most of their big prey, called blue sheep, resided, and there were several uh, herds of blue sheep there, probably numbering in total maybe about 100 of them, Mm. or 150. And the cats really depended upon that core area for their food, but they separated themselves temporarily so that when one cat was in the core area, the other cats knew how to stay away from that or, or they didn't come close. And the cat that was in the core area would make a kill, would finish it in uh, three days or something like that, and then take off and leave the core area. Hmm. And another leopard would come in and, and hunt in what was the resource-rich part of their home ranges. And we were totally puzzled. How the heck did they know this? You yeah. know, how did they space themselves? Yeah. And what we did was we set up a transect, which is basically a, a, a route that you walk, and we cataloged every bit of snow leopard sign that we saw. And we realized very early in the study that snow leopards marked in the environment very intensively. They left scent, scent in the form of a a scent spray on a rock, much as your cat might try to spray your sofa. Mm -hmm. They would uh, pick an overlapping, uh, overhanging rock that was protected from the monsoon rains and they would spray there and our noses would detect their scent after 30 days, so their noses probably detected it after 50 days or more. Wow. wow. And by that scent, any uh, we believe any other cat would know who had left it, would probably know their gender, would certainly know something about their reproductive status. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's the um, visiting card that tells you, hey, I'm in this area now, you stay away. Interesting. Or you come in if you're a female, you know, a male looking for a female. Wow. And yeah, yeah, that's kind of rare, though, isn't it? Because it's rare. Yeah, and yeah. yes, it is. And all the other studies were showing how more territorial, especially the male, yeah. would be. Uh, and the female, the males would overlap several female ranges. Well, you know, we had males overlapping males overlapping females, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think it was I think it's an adaptation to uh, an area where there are relatively sparse resources compared to the tropics. You know, they're not the biomass of of mammals up there that snow leopards mostly feed on is relatively low. Yeah. And so they've just uh, come across a very efficient sharing system. Yeah, they're kind of polite with each other in that way, it seems like. So that's amazing. And, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Rodney. Oh, no. I, yeah. Sorry. I, I was <laughs> following up. Well, I think it, you know, this is where you, I have come to realize that animals really aren't automated machines that run around doing patterns that, are, you know, I, I suppose selections put in them forever and ever. They are individuals. They are adapting to their environment all the time. And I think part of the, there's no record of a snow leopard ever having killed a human being. Hmm. There's a few records of snow leopards uh, sort of, I guess, not attacking a human being, but defending themselves when they're caught in a livestock pen. Oh, yeah. And a human is at the door, and the, the cat leaps out, and as it leaps out, of course, it claws the human standing there. But that's about it. Hmm. And, you know, they're very uh, docile and sort of passive. They, unlike a leopard there, I don't think they'd ever attack you. I think you'd really have to provoke them seriously. This concludes part one with our interview with Dr. Rodney Jackson regarding the Snow Leopard Conservancy and the beautiful Snow Leopard cats. So please stay tuned next week and you'll hear part two where we talk about some of the the challenges that these cats are facing and how the Snow Leopard Conservancy uh, is helping with the to alleviate some of these challenges and you'll also get to hear what gives Dr. Rodney Jackson hope for the future of snow leopards and wildlife in general. Thanks everyone. Thanks for all you do. 
Thank you for listening to Be Provided Conservation Radio. Links and resources to today's topic are in our show notes on iTunes. We appreciate your dedication and interest in protecting our natural world for future generations. If you like what you heard, please get involved by volunteering, donating, and sharing these podcasts with your friends. It also helps us to inform more people if you take a minute to leave a rating or review on iTunes. Have a great day, and thank you for listening to Be Provided Conservation Radio.